All righty. Welcome back to another episode of Sports to Suits, where weekly I get the opportunity to highlight former athletes that are doing amazing things in their former sport, but also in the business community. So I'm so excited today to have my friend Marcus Marshall on. Marcus, thanks for joining us today. Of course. Yeah, glad to be here. Thanks for having me on. So Marcus is a former University of Alabama football player. So what position did you play? I played fullback. I was a little battering ram going through the hole. So that's why I played. <laughs> they don't well, have and now anymore. you're doing some amazing things in business. So what are you doing now in business? Yeah, so now uh, just working in uh, healthcare, where we partner with health, um, employers and uh, throughout the nation. And what we do is we set them up with uh, surgery at different hospitals and uh, surgery centers throughout the nation and get them with different surgeons and with ortho uh, orthopedics, spine, bariatric surgery and other specialties. So um, that's what I'm doing now and love it. Uh, still use those competitive juices and uh, build a network. And so it's been good. Well, we're going to dive super far into that. But before we get started on the business side, I just want to talk a little bit about football. So how did you get started in football? Like, where's your athletic background come from? Yeah, actually, uh, just start off in uh, Tennessee. My, my dad played at uh, Tennessee State. And so uh, family, I mean, I had uncles that played football. And so it was kind of handed to me growing up. And I loved it. And um, I mean, at an early age that... Uh, I was really into sports. And in fact, I was, they put me in soccer and I kept pushing people around. My dad was like, yeah, we, we got to get you on the football field. So uh, that's how football came about. And I just loved it. And um, yeah, just took off with it. When did you start playing? Yeah, back then, uh, that's when you could start off really young. It was five years old, but that's back when, I mean, you're just tapping then. I mean, they. It's like peewee football, right? Yeah, peewee football. And uh, yeah, you, I mean, you're not doing anything. But um, yeah, that's back when, like, it's crazy now where the flag football and and uh, we didn't have that growing up. So five years no, old. No, I mean, I, I remember seeing like little kiddos, super little kiddos and like the full like helmet and pads and the whole, like the whole thing. Yeah, yeah. No, that was me back in the day. So yeah, my parents got me in early and. Like I said, I mean, my parents were just seeing me out there in soccer, and I, which I love. But, yeah, I was pushing guys around, and my parents were like, no, we let's put some pads on him. So when did you start getting serious about football? Was it always like, I'm going to go play collegiate or professional-level football? Or, like, when did you start thinking, you know, I can actually, like, go and do this in school? Honestly, um, like I always loved it. I mean, I, I picked up on it right away and loved it. But I would say probably middle school, um, my aha moment was uh, my parents sent me to a football camp at uh, University of Louisville. And uh, um, that was one where it was full contact. And so I thought, you know, it was one thing where I loved to play. And I went in and all of a sudden I'm playing against more people outside of my state, outside of my region. And that really opened up my eyes where one, I could hang with some of these guys and I got my butt kicked a little bit and let's say, let's be honest, a lot. And it was very really humbling, but it was like, OK, what do I need to get better and improve? And I think that's one that one moment that sticks out to me where I say, yeah, I want to see what I can do with this. So there's a lot of existing athletes. There's also a lot of parents of existing high school athletes that are trying to navigate going from now high school to college. So share a little bit about like the whole recruiting process for you, because University of Alabama is like a super well-known <laughs> football school. So what was that process like? And I'm sure it's a little bit different now, but when you were going through that, what was that like? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a lot different now with social media and just how everything's broadcast. But uh, at the time, uh, for me, what was big, my, I had a good support system. My parents they instilled in me it, it was not a decision or option it was like you're going to college that's it you just get to slide where so at an early age i was looking forward to going to college and so it was for me is a little different because it was the icing on the cake when you know i remember getting my first letter freshman year in high school it was from purdue and i said what do they want with me and i i thought you know it was like i watched college football i loved it i want to go to the next level but when they started recruiting, I said, well, 
wait a minute, maybe there is opportunity. And I was at a big program in Louisville, Kentucky, that really sent a lot of guys to college. So um, it was different. Just had a good support system. And, and my parents were helping me navigate through camps and visits to campuses. What would be the best fit for me? Um, I learned the business side very early on. Uh, I actually committed to University of North Carolina before I Alabama. And Mac Brown left um, right after my senior year in high school, the football season, and went to Texas. And so that's when uh, I, Alabama was still in the picture, and I just I decided to go to Alabama. So it was about the coaching, then. You went. To, you were like, I, I, I like the school. I like the coaching. Like, and I would imagine that you had a lot of different options at that time. Yeah, it was uh, like I love the, the UNC campus. I just had a canal, and it was just one of those things where um, I, I, again, I learned the business side of it, where they're going to leave. I mean, if there's opportunity, and um, you know, and I actually, it's funny, I'm passing it down to my cousin. I was telling him don't get so wrapped up in the coach. I mean, the coach can leave at any moment. I had a couple of coaching changes during uh, my time. So it was like really focus on the school and uh, what's going to be the best fit for you. So yeah, it sounds a lot. So if you've got parents of young kids right now that you mentioned that you got pretty um, savvy on the business side. And right now with parents ha it happen to help their kids with NIL and all of this other stuff going on, like what what tips or tricks would you just recommend to parents to be able to help them navigate that world? Because it's a whole new world. I mean, it's a it's it's changing the way that kids are selecting schools. Yeah, I mean, it's kind of funny. I think uh, Texas A&M's coach, he said something about everything that, you know, NIL deals have been around for a while. They were just legal, illegal back in the day. And and it's true. A lot of stuff that went on under the table is over the table now. And, and it's a recruiting process now or part of the recruiting process. So um, I would say really uh, get with somebody that really can talk you through that. I mean, I don't even know if you you can legally I, like I don't know enough to know if you can hire an agent or talk to an agent because you know back in the day that was a huge no-no but um I would do whatever it, would it takes to you know protect yourself because I mean I'm hearing some of these deals like the the quarterback of Alabama before he made one snap as a starting quarterback I think he had signed for over 1.1 million hadn't taken a snap yet now it worked out for him but you know all these other kids that um, uh, the kid from down here in Dallas uh, that went to Ohio State. I mean, it's crazy. He skipped out on his senior year of high school to go uh, to Ohio State and get in early so he could take advantage of the NIL deal. And where he, he came from is a very affluent area. But I think about those kids that if it weren't for football or sports, they wouldn't be in college. Like, what are those families doing? Like, I mean, they could totally be taken advantage of. And, um, you know, you you throw a kid $20,000 deal, he may go and blow it that weekend at the club or whatever. You just protect yourself as much as possible. So well, I don't know what like, You've got to educate yourself. Like it's unfortunate, but if you're, if you're a high school educator, like you got to educate your kids on all of this stuff. Cause they may not, to your point, they may not have the resources at home to support some of this stuff. I mean, having to navigate contracts, having to navigate brand sponsorships and deals, it's a whole, it's a whole new ball game. Yeah, no, it is part of the process. I mean, yeah, you brought up a good point. Like I hadn't even thought about that. Like, what do you do even at the high school level? I mean, I know a lot of my coaches, they were very protective, like who could come into the school and we had a process in my school. Um, who knows? I mean, with the NIL deals, I know, uh, when I was at Alabama, I mean, we went on probation. I mean, I'm, I'm very open about it, but I mean, what deals are being thrown at the coaches that uh, um, you never know? What are they talking them up about? Like, there's so many areas and and uh, places where you know kids could be influenced now, and it, it's pretty scary. Um, we'll see it what is happens. Super scary, you know, coming from a parent, <laughs> like it's just super scary because you. You never really know the ins and outs unless you know the ins and outs. And unfortunately, yeah. people are navigating a completely new era of the way that kids are going to colleges and the, the opportunities for kids to make money. I just saw an article a couple of weeks ago about a, a high schooler making a couple hundred thousand dollars on a deal. High schooler. <laughs> I don't know yeah. if 
know about you, Marcus, but if somebody handed me a check in high school, I was taking all my friends out. <laughs> we were gonna have a yeah. good old oh, time. Oh, it's not gonna end well. Yeah, it, it won't end well. I know that. I mean. <laughs> So why don't you, let's dive back into kind of the story around. So what was it like going from high school football into now you're playing at the University of Alabama? And if anybody has watched Alabama football, they know that there are some serious fans. (laughs) So I would imagine it was a totally different feeling walking onto the field for the first time playing in an Alabama game. Yeah, it, it was crazy. I mean, I uh, people ask me all the time, like, what was it that, you know, it, like certain schools like North Carolina, I was just like, I love Franklin Street. I love like the campus academics. And but what was it, Alabama? And what got me it was the first time I went to the Brown Museum on a recruiting trip and just all the tradition that was very eye opening for me. I mean, families just i mean people and fans from all over just going crazy i mean you you're at the time we we didn't have it where it is now but you have eighty five thousand in the stadium you have another thirty thousand outside of the stadium just tailgating it was mind-boggling and so um it i was very fortunate and blessed to have it happen you know have the athletic uh, ability to go but i was very fortunate to go i mean i appreciated it and, and was thankful but I uh, also saw the business side very quickly where, um, you know, you're seeing the Nike swoosh everywhere on everything you wear and and all these sponsorships and and people are right there, you know, kind of trying to help navigate and, and point you to, OK, you should do this. You should do that. And um, it, it was a fishbowl, especially at a place like Alabama, but just going to college and it was crazy. So how did you stay focused? So I would imagine that, you know, in gymnastics, right, when you're on a balance beam and there's people watching, you know, it's a little bit of a challenging thing to stay focused. But I would imagine just based on what I've seen on TV with University of Alabama football, that when you're there, like tapping into just pure and utter focus, like how did you go about doing that? Well, I mean, I, I go back to my parents. I mean, it was just a great support system. And another reason I looked at the University of Alabama, uh, my mom's originally from Birmingham. So I, like right up the road, an hour away, I had plenty of family. And um, I tell people all the time, you know, I was worried about my parents. That, that's back when Southwest Airlines, you could fly a round trip for about 80 bucks from Louisville, Kentucky. But I was more worried about my aunts and uncles in Birmingham that could get down, just get in the car and get down. So. I had a good support system there. You know, don't get too full of yourself. Um, I'll never forget, you know, when I got on campus, my dad, he flat out told me, he said, you know, don't forget about that name on the back of your jersey. I know you're here playing for the front, but don't ever forget that. And that just stuck out to me. And and it was like, don't ever do, meaning don't do anything to embarrass the name on the back of your jersey. So um, that helped me keep focus. I mean, I, I was just like another little 18, 19 year old that has all, all that attention. You know, there's times I got a little full of myself. and uh, But luckily, I have family kind of back me back down and, and bring me back to reality. So, um, yeah, I, I can't go. I can't say enough about the support system I had. And so that's what really helped out. So what did you learn from being on a high performing team like university, like the football team it is a high performance team? And so being mm-hmm. surrounded by that day in and day out for years, what are some things that you learned as being part of that team? Plenty. I mean, there's a lot of things I still use today. I mean, just one accountability, um, you know, it especially come from high school to college. I mean, you know, they tell you to have your foot on the line at 5 a.m. to work out. I mean, you better be there, suffer the consequences. And so just really that time management, um, really living up to the, I spoke about that tradition and it's like we want to keep that tradition we want to keep that high level tradition of su- success and and you don't want to be the team or the one that messes that up and so um accountability was big uh time management just really um I'm very big on iron sharpens iron I mean you get there and let's be honest in high school most programs you might have a few players on a team that are pretty good and most of the guys aren't going to the next level or going to play and you get there and it's very opening, especially at a place like Alabama, everybody's good. And and so it's just like, OK, I'm, I'll never forget one of the uh, first days of fall practice when I got there. We were at the stadium 
And, you know, I'm not going to use the colorful language, but uh, they basically said, you haven't done a thing here. Haven't done a thing. You're here now. You signed. What are you going to do? And and it was so true. It was, it was a challenge. Uh, step up. I'm like, yeah, you know, some of you guys are coming in with All-American, All-State, whatever, All-World. Haven't done a thing here. And and so that, that challenge, that push always is to be better better or get better that and that's the sales side <laughs> so i i've heard it over and over and over again in my sales career you start at zero yeah <laughs> you start at zero every year so that's yeah, what they reminded doing? me of exactly what you just said there so what are some things i want to talk a little bit about just your transition out so you played four years at Alabama, right? And you graduated and then what? Uh, reality set in. I mean, I just, uh, yeah. Everything you, was were finished. you trying to go pro or were you, were you done at that point? No, I knew uh, about my junior year, really uh, after sophomore year. So my position was kind of phasing out. You were having more pass offenses, uh, pass happy offenses. Uh, even now, I, I watch NFL and college football, and I'll see a fullback and get excited. Like, they really don't see too many fullbacks anymore. So um, I knew the NFL wasn't wasn't an opportunity. I mean, I, and I didn't want to be an arena, uh, arena football league guy that, you know, eight years down the road still, like, I'm going to get my shot. It's like, just go on, move on with your career. Um, I, and I was ready. Honestly, I, I was ready to, like, start the next chapter. I mean, I told you I started at five years old. So that was uh, tough to walk away and, you know, the reality of I'm not playing again. So um, I think just getting over that and then just as much effort as I put in when I got to Alabama and when I went to my high school, when I started there, OK, you're just going to, have to put that same effort in your career now. Like, what do you want to do? And um, so that was a transition. Um, there was definitely the, the transition going from, you know, all of a sudden. I mean, the good thing about going to a place like Alabama. Alabama, it was a job. I mean, as many hours we put in a week, I mean, between school and the sport and that was year round, that helped me prepare for life after college too. So uh, it was just putting that same effort and same drive into my career and figuring it out. So what was your for first role outside of college? Like where did, what, what type of role did you go into? So when I, I left college, I was thinking about uh, I really wanted to go into physical therapy. Uh, I had a lot of great uh, physical therapists throughout, uh, you know, plan. And uh, I, I said it was something I knew I wanted to go into healthcare, but I wasn't really sure. I, I knew that was a good route. So um, I went and actually I, I was overseeing a, a fitness center, like a hospital fitness center, um, working the floor there and uh, trying to get my hours uh, to go into PT school. And uh, it just so happened, you start living check to check. And I had a couple of the physicians at the uh, facility I worked at. They told me that they said, have you ever thought about pharmaceutical sales or medical sales? And, you know, those checks get a little leaner and leaner. And, and you know, reality is setting in. You got bills to pay. And um, that's where I kind of transitioned out of that. I wanted to go. I, I thought maybe I'll try this for a while. I could still go back to PT school. And um, but that's what I did when I first got out, getting ready for PT school. So what, why do you think, so, cause you have had a super successful career in sales and there are a lot of former athletes that seek out sales opportunities. Why is that? Number of reasons. I mean, I, I can't go out there and change things, hit somebody, go through the whole, like control the game, but that same competitive drive, I mean, I can use in the rankings with, you know, people that I go, I work with colleagues uh, for like now where I've transitioned to more business development. It's like I love getting a map and like go build it. And and just like I built it up, you know, built up my body in, in football or built up, you know, my knowledge of the playbook. I mean, you're taking those same tactics, studying, trying to get better and build in the um, business development or sales world. So. Um, it's a lot of those traits that helped me be successful in athletics that I used. And um, actually, I mean, like right now, it's really good because my whole team that I work with are former athletes. And they say the same things where, I mean, we trash talk with each other and, and we're good teammates, but we all work well together. We have one goal to grow. 
Um, and, and so uh, this I transition very well in the sales. It's a lot of things I'd use in sports that I take now. What are those things? Oh, time management. I mean, you you got you got to manage your time, right? Or you just going to you know be spinning your wheels? Uh, that accountability again. Uh, especially, you know, you have a lot of freedom in sales and, and you have people asking for things, but it's all on you. Um, you know, time, uh, uh, competitiveness, uh, I continue, I want to get better. I, I want to beat out, like I'm good friends with my colleagues, but I want to beat them every single day. I don't care if we're playing checkers. I want to beat them. I want to beat them. And so those are a lot of the things that come to mind immediately, but then, even just that drive, I mean, um, especially in sales, you, I mean, anybody's done sales or business development, you can have 10 conversations. You may literally pick your face up after all 10 of them. You got to put on your smiley face and do it again the next day. Just like if you had a bad practice or a bad game, what are you going to do the next day? Are you going to sit and mope and sulk? You better get back up and get back to it. And what are you going to do to get better the next time? So um, those are some of the things that, that has really helped me out throughout my career. I'm going to package that up and send that with all of my sales friends because, I mean, it's so true. You get smacked in the face literally all day, every day. Like and if you're day. not, if you're not getting resistance or getting the nose, then you're not doing your job. No, no, you got to like, push. You got to push. So, okay. What I want to talk a little bit about the other side from like a leadership perspective or a hiring perspective. So a lot of employees or employers look and seek out high level competitive athletes and rightfully so, because we have all of these incredible talents and skills that are just innate to our backgrounds. You know, we've, we've been conditioned like this since we were tiny kids, right? So if you were talking to an employer or somebody that was looking to just hire athletes, what are some, like maybe some tips that you would give to them? Because what I have found in my personal career is that I have sought out mentorship or sought out people that can help me elevate my career or guide me, but it's not always provided. Have you seen that too? Yeah. Yeah, very much so. I mean, I, I've been on both sides of it where I, I know now I, I tell people all the time, I mean, perfect example. Um, you can appreciate this being in Nashville. They, um, you know, there was a guy I worked with medical sales that he kept talking about. I'm Vanderbilt. I'm Vanderbilt and very good school. I, I love Vanderbilt. I mean, originally being from Nashville, my mom went to grad school there. But um, that guy from Vanderbilt, they kept talking about Vanderbilt, kept looking up at me in the rankings. And so, you know, I don't get so impressed with like the resume. Like, yeah, that's great. You went to Vanderbilt. But when I talk to you, I want to see what traits you have. Um, can I like I push on different things? Like, how do you react to that? Uh, like we just said, there's going to be days, there's going to be stretches where you don't get a signature with an agreement. You don't get a sale. You don't get anywhere. What do you keep doing? What are you trying to do to get there? And it takes a tough person, thick skin, somebody that's going to pick themselves up every day. And so, um, you know, being on, on the leadership side, that's something I look for. I look for different things. I mean, almost everybody that recruited me asked me the same question. Do you love the win or hate to lose? And, you know, some people you'll find out real quick. They want to answer thinking they know what you want to hear. Like, oh, I love the win. It's like, no, I want somebody that hates to lose that they expect to win on every single play or every single deal. And if something happens, like you're going to get more reaction on me if I lose just because I expect it to win. And it's like, if I don't win, what do you want to do? I want those people on my team. I want to bring those type people in. So um, I think it's tough to see some people, you know, they think they can read like a, a business book or go out there and, and they think they can talk the talk or they see, you know, was that movie uh, Glenn Ross, Glenn Gary or whatever. And oh, I, can, I, I had a guy literally that, um, you know, I would see him at the gym and we'd hang out sports bar or whatever, go watch sports and, very talkative guy. He's like, yeah, you know, I, I think I've, I've thought about doing medical sales and like, no, it's more to it. Like, I mean, you know, it, if, you know, I could see it it's just a even. Grind. When, it it's is a grind. grind. And it, it's yeah. not just, so one of the things, like one of my areas of expertise is managing really long-term relationships. Like I am a solid networker. Like I know from a sales perspective that I can manage a relationship for years, years and years and years. And so that is, 
you know, there's a lot of uh, sales positions that are very much short term closes. Right. And I am not a great resource for that because my intuition is to be a long game play is how can I help truly make substantial impact in this company as well as in this individual's life as a person you know so why don't you share because there's a lot of people that listen in on this and i would imagine that you have an area of expertise in sales too that may be similar to mine or may be different but there's so many different types of salespeople. Yeah, definitely. I, I would say for me, I mean, yeah, you have your hard drivers and I mean, it's no different than, you know, people you play sports with or like those coaches. And uh, like for me, it is. And and people, when they kind of get to know me, they're like, oh, yeah, you definitely were a fullback where it's like I, I drive like I don't want to like you. Of course, you want to take note, but where I just keep pushing and pushing and pushing and trying to, you know, if somebody gives me a note. I get the yes, keep driving, building. And so I would say um, that's kind of my style. Like I, I would say as far as You're like a closer. Um, yeah, but I mean, like I, I know some real closers, uh, actually a guy I work with. I mean, I, I consider the closer, but like for me, I I tell people all the time, I don't I really don't like salespeople. And I've had a lot of success because I do the opposite. Like everybody knows like that. My idea of sales was like that used car salesman, that cheesy person that's not genuine. And, you know, I'm, I try to be very transparent and say, like, look, maybe it's not for you. So I, I try to take the ethical side and the honest side and just say, look, I want to be a win win for both sides, no matter what I'm doing. But um, once I get that trust and credibility, yeah, go in and close every time, every time. I mean, don't you think, though, that there's a level of change that's happening in the sales community? Like, I think that that image of car salesmen, like, yeah, that that still exists today. But I think that by far the people that you see that are uber successful, not just straight out of the gate, but for a long term perspective, are people that are focused on the relationship and focused on actually like providing solutions. And, you know, I think that sales gets a really bad rep at times. Mm -hmm. Salespeople do, but I think it's an incredible profession for people that are motivated and driven and disciplined. And, you know, you, I've sold technology. I'm not a technologist, but I enjoy healthcare and I enjoy mm -hmm. the technology space. Right. So you don't have to be like a subject matter expert exactly in what you're selling per se. You have to have those resources available, but it's more about mm -hmm. managing a relationship than anything else. hundred percent. And that was, that's really kind of how I've done things. I mean, that's where I, I saw a kind of snicker when you said the close, because for me, yeah, at the end, I want to be a closer. Like, yeah. But the relationship is more important to me where I want to be a true partnership or true win from both sides. And so um, I, I agree 100 percent. And I, I have noticed that over the years and where you start to see more of the relationship, where it's, um, you know, going back to when I say, like, you know, I can't sell stand salespeople. There was one time one of my first cars I bought on my own and I'll never forget the guy. Yeah, I mean, it's not used to car sales, but. He was like helping me out, like look at the right thing. As soon as I signed on the dime, the guy didn't say a word to me the rest of the time. And to your point with the relationship where it's like, OK, I know what's going on here, the transaction. But, you know, not even really a thank you or, or just like, hey, you know, what do you think you'll do with the car? Like the relationship ended immediately. And I'm I think you're going to get even better results if you keep that relationship going and make it more of a partnership and a win win from both sides. Somebody's got to buy a car again. Like, and that's the, that's the mindset that I play, right? If you do business with me, I want you to enjoy doing business with me. I want you to enjoy the relationship yeah. and the value that we deliver from a partnership standpoint. I don't care if it's going to be a one-time transaction of because at some point I'll probably be able to help you again. But yeah. that's not, you know, it, you know it, I mean, it's hard. It's hard work. You know, I, what are some of your, what are your, some of your tricks? So, you close a deal and you want to continue staying top of mind with somebody. What does that look like for you? What do you do to continue to maintain the relationship? Yeah. 
Um, I, I think early on, I, I just I, I try to establish that credibility where, um, you know, I, again, going back to when I, you know, I was kind of snickering about the closer where I know those people that are trying to get things right away. And it's like, no, I want to give you all the details. How is this going to work? And so they see right away, like, OK, I want to work with you on this. I want to build this network with you or whatever I'm selling. And um, once you feel comfortable working with me and, and you know, contact me at any time. So I think early on, I established that, hey, this is a relationship. We're working together on this. And that helps me out throughout the whole process where, you know, it, they'll give me information that I was kind of needing. I wasn't really expecting or you know they that leads to the phone call to uh, for me in healthcare that physician that they want added to the network as well or that ceo of the hospital that they will want me to work with and do surgery at i mean uh you never know what those relationships will lead to or where they will lead and so uh, i think early on just making it known that hey i'm here to work with you not against you this is not going to end the moment you join our network um, I think that's helped me out a lot throughout my career. So I've got some some tips on this, too. So I'm a handwritten thank you card kind of lady. I know it is a pain Huge. to do it. I know it's a pain to do it. I hear you. And right now with everybody being remote, it's a little bit more challenging to do this. But if yeah. you have somebody that you're working with that even if it's not closing a deal, but something that somebody has done that is super kind and that stands out, man, Marcus, I cannot begin to tell you how many people will snapshot a thank you card that I've handwritten to them because it's just so unique. So anybody that's listening, handwritten thank you cards go a long way, not just for me, but also for your clients. So if you can find a way to incorporate that into your sales process, it is so powerful. Huge. I, I learned that on. I, I I had some really good mentors. Oh, I'm sorry. What's up? No, I just said it's super powerful. Oh, um, and you talk about mentorship like that. Let's dive into that a little bit. Yeah, I, I was just going to say I, I, I was lucky to have some really good mentors and they taught me that early on where I mean, just even going around at, like I was very big on roles, especially when I, I became a leader where they were shocked the first thing almost every job i want business cards and i want a box of thank you cards and they were like the business cards we get but, but just if i'm introducing myself I'm, I'm going to office hey you know thank you for taking your, you know i know you have a busy practice or a busy schedule thank you for taking five minutes to meet with me and introduce myself and so that's where i think it went a long way and i had people teach me that and people are shocked to even get that anymore and so um yes anybody listening You'd be surprised how far business or dropping your card and a handwritten thank you note goes. It, it will help you out so much. Another thing that so you mentioned, um, I carry business cards, but and I don't have them now. But one of the things that worked really well was a magnet. So you can get bulk magnets printed off. And this may not apply to every single industry, but in the healthcare industry specifically, you know, there's a lot of filing cabinets <laughs> and there's a lot of metal. And so if you can have yeah. a decent like a decent magnet that you can put up with like serviceable information or just promotional type stuff, I can't tell you how many hospitals I've walked into over the course of years. And I've looked up and there's been like a magnet <laughs> on the filing cabinets. And it's yeah, from like it 10 worked. years ago. Yeah. It's crazy. It's a big deal. Yeah, no, so those, let's talk those. about mentorship. Yeah. Like you've mentioned, you you dove just yeah. briefly into it. And I think that this is this is something I'm super mm. passionate about because me personally, I would have ended up probably in a much different place if I did not have incredible mentors along the way and business leaders that have stepped in to help me. So why why mm. Marcus is it so critical for people to have mentorship? And like what does that mean to you? To me, I mean, you know, I'm very big on, you know, they'll you see where they've gone, what they've accomplished. And and it's just like, OK, what helped you get there? And um, I know for me, when I mentor, it's like, look, look, let me get you get ahead of some of the mistakes you will make that I've already made. And and just what really helped me out, like I take the good and bad. I'm very upfront with people and, and let them know, like, yeah, this is something I face, like, you know, kind of keep an eye out on this or just with the good, it's like, I mean, with the business cards, like use that. So 
uh, I think it helps with guiding you throughout. And, and, you know, your career can be navigated in so many ways. I mean, at the beginning of the call, I was talking about I want to do physical therapy and I had the right people guiding me, uh, including my dad. I mean, he was a longtime State Farm agent. And so some of the people I grew up with, they were saying, OK, have you thought about this with sales? And then it led to business development. And so, uh, um, yeah, it's really helped me out along the way and try to avoid some mistakes that I would make. And, you know, sometimes I learn the hard way with different things. But then even going back to them saying, OK, I did this wrong. I think this is where I went wrong. What do you think? Good sounding boards. I mean, they're the ones that will help you navigate through wins and losses. And so um, it's been good. So we've talked to, so I was talking to somebody a little bit about this today, so I'm stuck on it. It goes alongside with mentorship. So I want to dive in with you because I'm a little bit curious on your thoughts. So one of the most powerful tools that I've been exposed to, not super recently, but more recently than not that I've actually like tied and in, tapped into it is accountability groups. So as a former athlete, being part of an accountability team is so critical and it's something that can be replicated uh, in your existing business with existing teams or even outside with like third party accountability partners or groups or mentors or whatever it may be. But somebody was telling me they they said it, it was so powerful. It was like accountability is that self like you you will not have any success with mentors if you're not accountable personally. You don't have that inner accountability. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah. That's very strong. Um, Isn't that strong? I've, it's like, yeah, I mean, I, I, I no, I, I mean, that's something very strong to think about where, it, like, I know it, where I agree 100% where, but it's just one of those things where it's so, it, it's very right. I mean, whoever said that, I, it's one of those things where it's like, once you said it, I said, yeah, that's it was Marcus true. Ogden I mean, is who said it. it. I'll give a total shout out to Marcus and Rhett Power. We're getting ready to to do a um, a webinar on this specifically, but it, it made mm -hmm. total sense because as an athlete, yeah. I mean, like you said with University of Alabama, like you were held accountable. If you were off your game, like they completely, completely called you out on your crap. Like. Yeah, there was no yeah, doubt about design. that. And I think that there's a lack of that. Like you have to be held accountable, but you have to have an accountability group as part of that. Yeah, no, hundred percent. I mean, that's one of the things that uh, that's where it's just like, you know, it's just like no different. I mean, you, you bring up like Alabama, the coaches are there to help you, but if you're not holding yourself accountable, it's like, okay, I'm going to help you get, make this play or, you know, I'm going to help you out. If you come, it's like one of those things, I'm going to help you, anybody that wants to help themselves. And so the coaches can try to drive you as much as possible. But at the end of the day, it's going to be on you to get it done. And so that's where I agree, even with the mentorship where, you know, I, I'm the type, I don't, I don't just say I have a mentee or a mentor just to say it. Like, I mean, I want them to put in the work. I want them to challenge me. I'm going to challenge them. And if they just think that I'm going to give them advice or I'll take advice and it'll magically happen, it's like, no, what are you going to do with that advice? So, um, yeah, yeah they're Johnson the ones that are going to help you. A great mentor is like a pair of wings that enable you to fly over and above great many obstacles. Like, but you have to be put, you have to be willing to put forth that work, right? It's not going to just be handed to you. Yeah. No, no, that's the thing. I mean, they're going to help you take it to that next level and and step it up. So, yeah, that I, I still like that that comment and uh, agree 100 percent. Like, I mean, yeah, I, I can tell you, I mean, I'll give you all this advice, but what are you going to do with it? You need to hold yourself accountable with what I'm giving you. So, yeah, I like even that comment by Patrick. Yeah. And playing in a big business game, like, and you, but you deal with this in healthcare, you know, it, it's a very, like, you have to put forth the energy and the effort. Like it's, you have to get the attention. It's not an easy market to tap into. Like people are busy, rightfully so they're, they're worried about saving lives. Right. So it's like, you've got to figure out how to drive value. And if you're not driving value, then they're not going to take the time. It's the same thing with like a mentor relationship. 
Oh, of course. Yeah. Especially healthcare. Healthcare never stops no matter what. So, um, yeah, can't take your foot off the gas there. What are some of the biggest, like, so what are some of the biggest challenges? Cause I, I think that people that, um, I think you could be very inspiring to other people, especially in the medical sales community and all of this resiliency stuff that we're talking about. What are some just words of encouragement that you could provide to maybe some entry level salespeople or some even some new entrepreneurs that may not have years and years and years of experience? Because it's a tough road. So what are some words of encouragement or maybe inspiration that you could provide to them? I mean, I, I sit there and, and lean back on your athletic background. I mean, you weren't always the best at what you did. I mean, when you, like I said, it when I got in the real world, I had to think about the first time I set foot at my high school. It was, we, I went to a nationally known high school and, uh, you know, you go to Alabama and they tell you, you haven't done a thing yet. It's the same thing here, but what did you do to have success there? Tap back into that. I mean, again, reach out to people. What, it just made you successful. Um, you, it's not going to go easy at first. Um, you will have your tough days, just like, you know, uh, for those people that play like football or whatever sport you played, you weren't doing the things you were doing. You got faster. The game got faster. Then it slowed down once you figured it out. And so um, tap back into what you did and uh, you made it once. You'll do it again. This is just a different type of uh, competition and and different uh, way of attacking whatever you, you have in front of you. And so, um, you know, I, I had a mentor speaking of mentors early on that is really stuck with me where he said, always go to the kiss method. Keep it simple, stupid. <laughs> It is so true. Like people overthink things so much. And and I think it's just one of those things where, um, you know, don't overthink it. Like what helped you get to this point? Uh, you're going to take your bumps and bruises. You're going to have those days where nothing's going right. What do you, you do to overcome that? So, yeah, I, I think that's a good way to tap into, it, especially for former athletes. And don't, so Adam Mitchell chimed in as well. If you don't have a mentor, mentor, find one. Some are lucky to have access to one. If not, then seek one. It is so critical in business success. And when you, when it comes to mentorship, like I want people that are going to challenge me. <laughs> like, and as a former athlete, I don't want somebody that's going to tell me, unicorn, like everything's amazing, unicorns and rainbows. You're doing a great job. I don't want that person. I want the people that are going to be like, you're not doing what you said you're going to do. <laughs> yeah. I have to hold myself. Yeah. But that's, I think that that's something that also like athletes are really used to having constructive criticism, but having it delivered in a way that's very specific and like <laughs> almost aggressive in a, in a sense. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But I mean, it, you know, we talk about the accountability. It goes for the mentor as well. Um, I, I've I actually, I've, had a couple that I just said I was really getting very reason where um, they had six, but they didn't really know how to really coach somebody else up or help them get there. And uh, but at the same time, it, you know, I hold them accountable as well. Like called me on this. Um, I'm very big on poke holes in my idea. Like if I bring something to you or I'm thinking through something, poke holes in my thinking, like where am I going wrong? And so I hold them just as accountable as I will myself. So. so um, it's I a think mutually it's very beneficial important. partnership. Like it's such a mutually beneficial partnership. It's, oh, yeah. you know, you have to be challenged on both ends. Like it's nobody gets better if everybody just sits there and agrees with everybody. <laughs> no, no, I, I don't want a yes person. I, I don't deal well with that. So yeah, challenge me, push me. So, so how do you, so one of the biggest things that I think that, especially football, basketball, you know, gymnastics is a little bit different. There's teams, but it's not the same, right? So what did you take from the sport as far as like the team dynamics, working with a team, hiring into the team? What did you, so if you have people that are hiring, that are maybe not hiring specifically athletes or whatever it may be. Like, how do you go about ensuring that that dynamic stays forward facing and powerful? Uh, a few things. I mean, one, I, I want, they have to be a good culture fit. I don't want somebody that's going to come in and I want them to be confident. I mean, there is a, a difference between co confidence 
and cockiness that's going to come in as far you know, if I'm hiring or even if I'm on the team and they're bringing somebody in, be a good culture fit um, that's going to get along well. Uh, always bring in somebody that's going to be better than you. I mean, like for me, I was the power guy. And, and with my team, I was the one like pushing through just so I could open up the hole for the speed guy. And so like you have one area where you're good at, hire the person that that is good at your weakness and vice versa. That goes back to iron sharpens iron, like help each other out. Like, how can I get better? You're really good at this. I've learned from you. I want to work with you. I'm good at this area. We can work together. So those are two things that really helped out. And then just the whole team atmosphere where you want to win. I don't care if it's in sports or in the business world, you, the goal is to get better and do, you know, win and get to that one goal you have, you need the whole team mentality to do it. You don't need a bunch of individuals going out in their own, uh, their own way with things. So once you can come together as a team, bring your strengths to the, uh, the table, I think this helped out a long way as far as having successful teams. So that's why I've taken from sports. Definitely. Well, and be transparent, like not, nobody is amazing at everything. <laughs> like no. this was something that I really dove pretty far into is like, what do I bring to the table in the business sense? And what do I just absolutely, yep. what am I terrible at? <laughs> like, for yep. me, I'm terrible at spreadsheets. Like I absolutely hate working in data and spreadsheets and all these things. But that opens up an opportunity for somebody that absolutely loves spreadsheets or loves something different. And it's OK to thrive in different capacities. Like, but you have to be very self-aware yeah. about what you are good at and, and vocalize that. Like, I think a lot of people go into companies and are just expected to know everything about everything. That's not the case. Yeah. No, no. And I, I mean, that that's a really good point. I mean, that's where I'm big on where. I'm not that good at this or you're strong in this area, but something else I just thought about too, uh, going, you know, especially with the team where I know on teams, I, bringing what I bring to the table, I better, you know, I better come with 110% of my effort, but I don't want to let them down too. And I feel that's the same going back to the culture. I want that person that, Hey, I'm going to have my tough days, but at the end of the day, I'm going to push because I don't want to let down the other team have, I don't want to be that weak link. So that's something else that's helped out too, where you don't want a team that everybody's striving. We're hitting goals left and right. And you have that one person just coming up in the rear. Like, I don't want to be that person. So um, that's helped out where it's a lot of people want to drive and, and get the best. So last week, John Roethlisberger said something that was so profound to me, even though it was so simple. He said that they post a, uh, a it's a goal board that everybody puts up goals and it's very, you know, it could be something very simple or very, very large, but it's, you know, what are they, what are they trying to accomplish? And I think that that level of transparency in regards to what each individual is looking to accomplish as well as what is the team looking to accomplish is such a powerful tool that I have not, I've not done before, but I was like, I'm going to try yeah. to incorporate that into, into what we're doing because it's so powerful for you to write that out post it, everybody to go through that exercise mm -hmm. and then to hold each other accountable to your individual goals, but also your team-based goals. Yeah. I mean that, you know, I'm probably going to steal that. <laughs> so <laughs> I know I mean, John's going to, we're going to have goal boards, but he, you know, he just, it was so, it was such a simple thing that if I'm operating with a team, it's so simple. It's something that would take maybe, you know, one of it, take time with one of your meetings that you have on the calendar. Right. But something that's so powerful yeah. because each individual person and Marcus, I'm sure that you probably experience this too. Like each individual person has goals. They have a vision. They have a mission as why they're working for the company. And yes, yeah. it's important to follow all the company's goals and things like that. But it's like, what are you trying to achieve? Mm -hmm. No. That, and Marcus, I, if you knew I that I great. wanted to be an executive leader, I'm sure that you'd be like, this is the path that you have to go down and this is what you need to do. And you would support that. Mm -hmm. yep. But if people no. don't know, they don't know. That's so true. I mean, and again, going back to the mentor, having people around that's supporting them and, and pushing them. And if you don't know what you don't know. And, and you know, that's again, I, I forgot who popped in and just saying you can't find one or you don't have one go find one because you know if you have these goals you want to get there 
go find somebody that got there that is achieving what you want to get to and just see how can you help me get there with and so I, I think that's very strong right there and don't just find somebody that talks about it so that's something that i'm you know i've, I've had a lot of conversations with people find people that have actually done it yeah find people that have done it that know the path yeah. to get there because if i yeah. want to be a university of Alabama they, football player <laughs> marcus it may not be my path but you could at least share how you got there right and all the work that you had to put in and every single step that you had to take to get there mm -hmm. but that's not that's a that's a place that you've been you walked in that in that path yeah and and this is where you know the whole transparency you brought up or i um uh, sorry I, I think i was having a little con connectivity issue um, okay. I want to hear about the times when your buddy, your your buddies were out, you know, doing run around town and you were in the weight room or you were at home studying for a project when everybody was a gorgeous day outside. Like you're doing the little things to get to the bigger things. And so um, the sacrifice you had to make, like, I want to hear about that. I don't want to hear about you bragging about what you did or how you got there. And no, tell me about those days where you were second guessing yourself. So um that's the kind of people I want to be around and, and be mentored by and work with. It's not sexy. Like I said this on a, I was talking to somebody again earlier today, like the, the grind, the journey, like the business struggle, it's not a sexy road. Like I know that we see a lot of like social media posts and there's a lot of unicorns and rainbows floating out there, but to get into these leadership roles or to use your background in sports and to climb the corporate ladder or to jump into entrepreneurship, it is not sexy at all. <laughs> like, it's just not. It's not. No. It's a, it's a hard grind. Yeah. No, I I've uh, so especially with what I do, where um, throughout my career, people hear about me eating at this restaurant or having business dinners and all, all this cool. And I'm like, you, you want to go there and relax and go enjoy a good meal. I never turn it off. Like even if you're out there at this restaurant you're still working. You're trying to get a goal of getting the deal or moving, working with that person. And it was very eye opening. Uh, it was uh, my then fiance. She was uh, she went to a dinner with me because she was just like, oh, you're going to these cool places. And she saw one, a different side of me where it's like you're continuing to work like when let her, everybody's letting their guard down you're still working and that's just one example where people will hear about different things they think it's so glamorous it's like you try doing that almost every day a week you try being on a plane every day and you come home you wake up you're like what city am i in like they 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 hear about oh you were in seattle or you were in vegas and chicago and or you're doing medical like, sales which, or pharmaceutical sales like yeah yeah no it's they don't see either. all of it or the sending out the emails at eight and nine o'clock no. at night because you didn't no. have time to, you know, get to the quote because they, you were, you know, taking doesn't. clients out, all no. that stuff. Well, we're right no. on time. No, so they, I want to wrap up, but are there any additional like no. thoughts or um, any additional tips or tricks you would give to, especially existing or uh, newly transitioning athletes? Yeah. I mean, uh, one of the biggest things for me, I will, I would tell and I, I tell guys now or men and women I've talked to that um, just use those talents you had and transition in the real world like you you weren't going to be able to play that sport forever and it's a tough transition I, I mean look I it was tough for me first time I went back for a home game and it was like I miss this so much but now take that talent and take that drive and use it in another area just redirect and um, the world does not end when when sports ends and there's a whole bunch more you can do and um, I would just say, use those, you know, the things to do, just do it in a different role in a different way. And, um, going back to what one of the other guys chimed in about, we kind of, we were talking about a lot, find a mentor. I mean, find those people that, you know, get connected in the right way. And then those accountability partners, you know, some of my best friends that are, are ones that I've met very early in my career and we've kind of gone our different paths, but we still are always pushing each other and holding each other accountable. And, oh, OK, you're in a different industry. 
but there's things I, I can take from what you're doing. So not only mentors, accountability partners, but um, be open to uh, transitioning what you did in sports to the real world and the career. It's amazing. I have absolutely loved this conversation. I cannot thank you, Marcus, enough for joining today and sharing just all of your all of your genius with everybody. I mean, you're doing some amazing things in this world. How can people continue to follow your journey? So I'm going to go ahead and put a link um, in uh, the post about your LinkedIn profile. But what are other ways okay. that people can get in contact with you? Don't get phone yeah, number. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, no. LinkedIn's a really good way. I mean, just, you know, if you put that up, that's a really good way to get in touch with me, you know, reach out, connect. And um, yeah, I mean, just even the two people that popped up on the uh, during our call, I, I'd love to connect with them and even talk with them. So um, yeah, just LinkedIn would probably be the best way. And i uh, love to stay in touch with anybody that was interested today. I, I don't know. I'll be honest with you. I, I thought I'd put some people to sleep out. When you first asked me to do this, I say, who wants to listen to me? But I, I really oh enjoyed my gosh, this no, this has been an amazing conversation. So we had lots of people tuned in. Adam and Patrick like to um, like to put some comments in. So if you're listening, definitely pop a couple of quick comments in so that Marcus knows that you're that you're here. But I mean, this conversation has just been so powerful. And once again, I can't thank you enough for joining. And to everybody that continues to listen and to support the show, thank you so much. Uh, this is definitely a highlight of my week. So I'm always grateful to, to have conversations and to talk about, you know, how athletes can tap into some of the amazing qualities and, and things that they've done in the sport and tap into that in the business community. So I look forward to next week's episode. And for everybody that is listening, once again, thanks. Thanks so much. And we'll see you again next week. Thank you.